Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Relationships. They make up every human interaction and activity in our lives. Not only are they just a part of life, God made them integral into who we are. In God's Word, we find the ultimate guide in navigating conflict, relating to others, repairing broken relationships, and letting go of your past. Let's dive deep into the wisdom of God and get real. Well, good morning. How are you? Well, welcome. If you're new with us, I am one of the teaching pastors here. My name is, excuse me, my name is uh, Andy Mead. And um, if you're with us online, we're glad that you're joining us. And we're gl- we believe that God's got a good word for you. We are in the middle of a series. I was looking at a, uh, a little comic strip this past week. And it had, um, it had a pastor. He was up and he was talking and he said, uh, he goes, well, this morning, I want you to know, I went ahead and had my wife look over my sermon transcript and asked her, could you please just scratch out all the things that were dull and uninteresting? And he goes, so in conclusion, <laughs> <laughs> Sharon would never do that, but uh, sometimes I feel that way, right? So hopefully we're going to do, we're doing stuff in this uh, Get Real series where it's not dull and irrelevant. Uh, but it's something that you can use. And today we're going to be talking about listening because listening is such an important skill set. And so often that's an area that most of us can, uh, can grow in and an area that's, that bothers us. It's probably the number one complaint I hear, particularly among uh, couples. They say, you know, uh, she doesn't listen to me. She, he doesn't understand me. He doesn't take the time to hear me out. And, uh, there's, and, and it's just frustrating and, uh, and it really shouldn't surprise us because listening is something that very few people are trained in. I found a statistic saying today that only 2% of professionals have actually had some kind of training in how to listen well and to honing their skills on that. We spend approximately 40% of our waking hours listening, and yet we only listen at about 25% efficiency. And so we're going to talk about the art of listening, and it is something that we can, we can develop and grow if we give our attention to that. And if we do get better at listening, we'll have fewer arguments, we'll make more friends, we'll be a lot wiser, we'll either even be healthier. I read uh, in, uh, by James Lynch in The Cry Unheard, New Insights into the Medical Consequences of Loneliness. He says every time that you listen or we listen, our blood pressure actually goes down. Every time you're talking, your blood pressure goes up. So that means right now my blood pressure is probably a little higher than yours because I'm the one doing the talking. But it's, it's actually physiologically good for us. What is listening? Well, uh, the Bible has a lot to say about listening. We're going to look at some of that. Uh, and then there's some things that we want to avoid that's really not listening. James says this, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You see, in friendships, you cannot really win an argument. That's, that's a misnomer. You can't win an argument because if you win, you still lose. And if you lose, of course, you lose. Ben Franklin said it this way. He said, if you argue, argue and rankle and contradict, you may achieve a victory sometimes, but it will be an empty victory because you will never get your opponent's good will. And so James says, you Here's the formula that if you're not listening, you're going to get angry. And so if you're full of angry, one of the things you need to evaluate is, is how's my listening? How's my listening? If I'm always angry, there's probably, James says, a problem with how we're going about listening to other people. And listening is more than just sounds of somebody. They're making, you know, making noises. Just, it's more than just hearing. I mean, there's people, sometimes you've probably seen it, maybe you've been part of it, where they just talk at each other. There's no listening going on. This is real common, I think, uh, in TV, especially the national news, which really, there's less and less national news. It's these, 
It's these TV opinions. Where, I mean, these people just, they're just waiting to say their thing. They're not, they're not listening. You can just tell they're not engaged in listening. They're just waiting to, for them to be able to say what they want to say. And this happens in our relationships too sometimes when we're just kind of waiting our turn. Yeah, 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 are you almost done? Because I have this to say. Well, that's not listening. That's not listening. I think one of the reasons that bars tend to do so well uh, is because a bartender likes, will listen. I mean, I think way more valuable than the drink that's purchased is the fact that somebody will listen to them. I had a psychologist friend of mine, actually a dean of, uh, of, of uh, a graduate school, and she said that really a counselor is a paid friend. I mean, certainly they have some training, but really it's a paid friend, somebody who will just listen to you, something that most of us really want and need in our lives. Human, be, human beings need that. They, they need, we talked about this last week, they need to be appreciated. It's a core thing. It's, it's, it tells, says to us, we're valuable. We have value. Our life matters. Somebody cares about us. And so really, when we're listening, we're loving. And so if you want to be more loving, then you need to be more listening. It's that simple. Paul Turner, the Swiss psychiatrist, said it's impossible to overemphasize the immense need of human beings to really be listened to. So if you want to have better friendships, better mates, better boyfriend, better girlfriend, husband, wife, better uh, relationships with your employees, with your students, with your administrators, you, you, we need to learn how to listen. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at three hearing blocks, things that cause us to not listen, and then three hearing aids that certainly we all can use. Number one is presumption is a hearing block. Presumption. It keeps us from listening. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his Shame, what's he talking about? He's talking about assuming you know what somebody's thinking. So you don't even have to wait for them to answer, right? We've seen this on TV quiz shows. You know, maybe they have a buzzer involved or something, and they, they start reading a question, and they hit it too quick, and then they answer it, and they're way off. I mean, they're not even on the same subject because they did it so early. Then once the question was completely read, then they, everybody knew it then, you know, on the, on the show. But they were too early. And we do that sometimes. We've, we've got that little buzzer in our own little head. They start talking, oh, I know where you're going with that. Yeah, I'm on top, yeah, oh, oh yeah. And we just, and we, and we just, we, we jump into it and we assume we know what other people are going thinking, are feeling, are, th- are, are, are going through. Uh, here's four wrong assumptions. One is, is that, that uh, there's only one way to see things. And this is not true. There's many ways to see things, but that's what we often think. Or everybody thinks like I do. This is, uh, we just kind of project our own worldview, our own way of thinking onto other people, but people think all kinds of different ways. That's one of the beauties of beautiful things about things like these self-assessments, like the Myers-Briggs type indicator, where you take that, you learn, oh wow, there's 16 different ways, but really it's layered way beyond that. I mean, there's so many ways to, to approach a subject or approach relationships. People think differently. People never change is another presumption, and this is not true. People do change. They, people change. I think of the, so I've changed on, on major issues, sometimes just through study, sometimes learning from somebody else, sometimes experience, sometimes God, I feel like, impressed something on me. But over the years, I've changed on a lot of things. We change. And then I can figure out your motives. This is a, this is a big one for some people because they really think, oh, I know, you know, I, can, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling. Hey, folks, listen, I, I don't even know half the time why I'm thinking what I'm thinking or the motives I've got. So how in the world could you figure it out? You know, I mean, and, and it's true for all of us. We're, most of us, we do things we're not even aware of why we're doing it. And so that's kind of reserved for God. He's the one who is able to read our minds. We don't want to be the mind reader. Don't play that game. You know, where we, oh, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, you probably don't. You probably don't. And so when you assume that you uh, can read somebody else's mind, you're at, you're my, you actually have a closed mind. And there's nothing harder to open than a closed mind. So you don't want to fall into that. Hey, you know, don't confuse me with what you're saying. I already know the facts, you know. Now, listen, this is very important. This aspect of listening, not assuming taking the time to do this, particularly, for example, in our church. Our church, 
uh, is a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multicultural church. And so that means we're going to see things differently. And it's going to take work. You can't just get a sound bite off of the TV to figure out where somebody is coming from on, on another issue. Uh, for example, like recently, of course, you, we all know about the NFL s- sit-downs during the anthem. And, and uh, you know, and I watch TV like everybody else. But I really wasn't getting it. I knew that. So I sat down with three of my black friends and I said, just tell, help me to understand really what's going on. I mean, I know the sound bites. I need to know something beyond. I, and I just went into a listening mode, really learning what's going on, how, what's happening here. Because I have friends that ha- are on both sides. And so, and this church obviously is going to be represented from people on different sides on this issue, on the issue of uh, a number of things in, in, our, in our land that, it's, it's really separated by politics or by race or by gender or by age. And we have to be willing to be listeners to get into somebody. Help me to really understand it. Not just parrot something back we saw on CNN or Fox. I mean, it takes more than that if we're serious about it. And so it, it is a challenge. It is work to learn to listen. Carl Rogers, the eminent psychologist, wrote this in his book on becoming a person. He said this, quote, I have found it of enormous value when I can permit myself to understand the other person. The way in which I have worded this statement may seem strange to you. It is necessary to permit oneself to understand another. Here's why. He says, our first reaction to most of the statements which we hear from other people is an evaluation or judgment rather than understanding of it. When somebody expresses some feeling, attitude, belief, our tendency is almost immediately to feel that's right or that's stupid, that's abnormal, that's unreasonable, that's incorrect, that's not nice. Very rarely do we permit ourselves to understand precisely what the meaning of the statement is to the other person. If you're familiar with Stephen Covey and his writings, he says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. So presumption blocks hearing. Number two, impatience. Impatience will block our hearing. Because we just get so impatient. I mean, listening to somebody is hard work. And, you know, somebody can talk at about 150 words per minute. We can listen at 650 words per minute. That's a 500-word boredom factor. That means while I'm speaking, you can be thinking about, hey, what am I going to do for dinner tonight? Uh, You know, some of the appointments I've got coming up this week. Uh, you know, what should my, my workout plan look like, you know, my eating plan, and when should I go to the gym, and, you know, and maybe I should call my, you know, so-and-so, and, and all while I'm speaking, and I'm trying to compete, you know, and so I throw a joke in from there on anything to keep you with me, <laughs> because it's hard, because it, it's easy to be impatient. Come on, come on, come on. This used to be a difficult thing for me, particularly when we were first married. You know, and with Sharon, you know, she would be talking and, and I'd say, come on, keep going, you know, let's get to the, get to the end here, you know, I'm, uh, impatience, that's not, that's not all that helpful in those, it, when it comes to relationships, we need to be patient. Ernest Hemingway once said, when people talk, listen completely, most people never listen. How do you know when you're being impatient with somebody? A couple ways, number one is we tend to interrupt. We, try, we, we just kind of push them along, interrupt them, maybe even fill in the blanks. They're saying something, they, st- they kind of slow down in the middle of a sentence, and so we fill it in, right? We're just, we can't take it anymore. <laughs> or we jump to conclusions. We jump to conclusions. It says, notice this verse here in Proverbs. Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than that person. And so speaking in haste, Jumping to conclusions, this is the, the guy, he's the new employee, he's in a large insurance company, he takes this uh, big document, very fat, he goes up to this paper shredder, and he's looking at it, and he's kind of confused. And so the senior secretary notices that, she goes, can I help you? And he goes, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to use it. She goes, well, let me show you. Uh, and she takes his document, and she shreds it. And, uh, and then she goes, did that explain it? He goes, well, I was just wondering how many copies it made. <laughs> okay doesn't get any whole lot better I think I got one more like that so just prepping you up front (laughs) but 
when we're presumptuous. You know, we just, we, don't, we jump to conclusions. Proverbs 19, 11 says, a man's wisdom gives him patience. I like how, you know, sometimes the Bible, like, insults you, and you, you, you don't even know it. You know, a man's wisdom gives him patience. That means if I'm impatient, what? I'm kind of dumb, right? <laughs> and so if I want to express my wisdom, I'm patient with my kids. If I want to be wise and express wisdom, I'm patient with my employees. I'm, if I want to be wise, I'm patient with my mate. I'm patient with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I'm patient with my friends. This is a mark of wisdom. Presumption and patience. Another blocking to our hearing is pride. Pride. That's because pride makes us defensive and unteachable. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool seems right, but a wise man listens to advice. And so learning to ask quality questions is often an act of humility. Emerson said, every man is a superior in, my, in some way, and in that I learn from him. And so sometimes it's more important for us to appear smart than to be smart. But the truth is, we become smart when we listen. Most of what we learn is through listening. And so that's how we become smart. And a big part of becoming smart is being willing to be humble enough to learn from others. Some people say, well, I like to learn on my own. I learn from my own experiences. Well, that's good. But the problem is uh, you have a finite, limited, relatively small amount of experiences compared to everybody else. And so we can learn so much more by learning from the experiences of others. Everybody here knows things that I don't know and vice versa. Every, you know, and we're all ignorant on different things. And so if we listen, we can grow and learn so much more than if we just try to do it on our own. But it takes this level of humility to be able to say, hey, I have a question for you. I, want, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not all knowing. Proverbs 12 or 20 verse 5 in the Living Bible says, Through good, though good advice lies deep within a counselor's heart, the wise man will draw it out. And so this idea of having quality questions to really think about it. When I go to listen to somebody who uh, in my field is somebody I feel I can learn a lot from, before I even talk to them, if I get an opportunity to talk to them, I'm thinking through what questions. I only have a limited amount of time with this person. What are the questions that I can ask them? I'll often write those down and then like prioritize them because quality questions. Here's the way good news translates that, that passage. It says, a person's thoughts are like water in a deep well, but someone with insight can draw them out. So good questions. Somebody said the two perfect ages are four and 14, because at four, you know all of the questions, but at 14, you know all the answers, right? <laughs> I got it all. Some people never grow up. And so we learn to ask questions. Also be willing to learn from correction. This one certainly is harder because nobody likes correction. Proverbs 15, 31 says, if you pay attention when you are corrected, you are wise. Now, it's one thing to learn from the advice of others when you've asked for it, and that's good. It's another thing to in, uh, learn from the advice of somebody when they give you unsolicited advice. You didn't really care what they had to think, and they decided to give you their advice anyways, right? And that's a lot harder, and often it's critical advice. And it, so it hurts, and it's just like, it comes at us, we think, you know, I don't want, I don't want that. I, I don't have time for that. I, I don't have the emotional uh, capacity for that right now. I'm not interested in that, and we shut it down. Often the way we invalidate somebody's criticism is by looking at the source. We look at that person, and they go, well, they're not perfect. Who are they to give me that? Look at how they live their life. Or, or we get personal. Look at how they raise their kids. I wouldn't listen to anything they had to say. And this happens a lot. In marriages, because we know somebody's weaknesses a lot. And so we, we know all of their idiosyncrasies, all the things, and we think, who are you to say anything? You know, I got your number, buddy, or gal, or whatever. And so we, we're not interested in criticism because it's very hard. But, you know, here's the fact. This, uh, often criticism does not come from our friends. Our friends love us too much, so they won't tell us, or they, you know, they want to just be kind, and they, they want to always be on our good side. Sometimes it's our critics we learn the most from. And he, listen, if you can only learn from perfect people, you're not going to learn a lot, because there, there's no perfect people out there, right? We all make mistakes. And so the key to learning from 
Criticism is to separate criticism from the source, from the critic. Now, it doesn't mean that everything somebody says that's critical is true. Certainly, that's not accurate. There's a lot of things people say that's not true. And so you ignore that as you should. The Bible says ignore that kind of stuff. But here's what you need to do is, is when you get criticism, you, have, you distance it from the, from the critic, from the source, and after, it kinda, after the, the hurt wears off a little bit, you ask, is there any validity to that? See, this is, a, uh, this is where you have to get past pride. Say, is there any validity to this? Is this something I can really grow from? Is this something that's holding me back in my relationships? A pastor preached his first sermon in a church, and he said, hey, I really want to grow uh, in my skills here, so if, if there's anything that you guys have to say about my preaching, I want you to know, come up after the service. So after the service, somebody comes up and says, you know, uh, that sermon was terrible. And he goes, well, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, first thing, you read it. Second thing, you read it poorly. Third thing, it should have never been read in the first place. <laughs> so, so the pastor feels kind of bad, you know, and then another guy goes up in case, hey, don't listen to old Joe. He just repeats what he hears everybody else say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's the last one, so let's move on, okay? We need to be careful about criticism. Romans 14 and 15 actually talks about this issue of criticism and says, hey, you need to, you need to listen to it and then evaluate it and then some of, some of it just ditch. Say, hey, that, that is invalid. That does, that's just your own thing. But some of it we need to address. Four types of critics. One is, is there's this lawyer type. They build a case. They call in witnesses. They submit evidence. They cross-examine they're often very legalistic, and they're very harsh. And maybe, maybe you're like this. Maybe you're married to somebody like this. Maybe you have somebody in your life who's this lawyer type, the letter of the law, and then they're looking for any kind of gap in your logic, any kind of gap, you know, and then they're right there to, hey, you hypocrite. What kind of Christian are you? Then there's the theologians. And theologians quote Scripture for everything. Everything's got a verse doesn't mean that they're quoting it properly. And certainly the way they use it often is more like a bulldozer. You know, where God's word is meant to be used in a loving way. No, they, they throw around verses and then they'll say, God said this. And that's below the belt, folks, because how are you going to argue with that? Oh, yeah, God said that. Well, I mean, who are you going to quote that's better than that? You know, right? <laughs> so we want to be careful we're not doing that. Third type is the historian. They never forget what you do. It's like the guy who said, yeah, last night my wife got historical. He goes, you mean hysterical? He goes, no, historical. She brought up everything that I ever did. <laughs> I guess I did have another one, didn't I? <laughs> okay. Well, then there's the psychologist. They love to analyze you. You know, they all love to look for your weaknesses. And their favorite phrase, you know, I knew you were going to do that. Or, you know, you would never understand. Well, then why bring it up if I'd never understand? You know, and they just, they're, they're always like, there's your, you know, they're your, uh, your personal unsolicited shrink. You know, they're always there to evaluate everything and to say, oh, yeah, you got a lot of dysfunction issues going on there, man. You know, and, they're all, and, and you, can't, you can't deal with the stuff on the table because they're always getting real personal. They're always trying to dig into the personal stuff and your, you know, your, your parents and all these things. And I'm not saying those things don't apply, but often that's, they're, they're, you know, they're like, self-appointed psychologist in your life, your own therapist that you didn't want. So if we're going to be good listeners, we've got to be careful of that kind of stuff. Three hearing aids, real quickly. Number one, listen with your eyes. Listen with your eyes. 80% of conversation is nonverbal. It's through facial expressions. It's through hand gestures. It's through body movement, always, and your eyes. Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at him. He's talking about the young, rich young ruler. And he loved him. I love that. Because, see, when we listen to somebody, we are loving them. When we're giving them our full attention, when we're listening, when we're looking at them, there's, that's a very powerful thing when you look at somebody because it says you have my undivided attention. You're, you're, that's, you matter. And we prove it by looking at them looking at them right in the eye. There's something very, very strong with that. Eyes can be a conduit of our feelings. Luke 11:34 says, your eyes light up your inward being. You see, we, when, we, when we look at somebody's eyes, there's something kind of reflects 
about their soul, about their condition of what they're feeling and where they're at. And it's true with our own eyes. So there's, it's important that we look at somebody eye to eye. When's the last time, if you're a parent of a young child, that you've gotten on your knees down at their height and you looked them in the eye to talk to them? That says, you know, right at their level. If you're the parent of a teenager, when's the last time you've gotten a stool out and then you stood up on it <laughs> and you look up, you know, to your, to your kid and say, you know, I'm going to look you in the eye to the best of my ability, you know, because you're important to me. You're valuable to me. This is important in, 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 in marriages. Some people, they've been married for so many years and they've lost this ability to listen with their eyes. And they don't really look at each other anymore. You can sometimes see them. They're, I mean, out and about, maybe at a restaurant. They're just all, both on their own, their own phones. They, if they were to really look and engage with each other in their eyes, it would almost be awkward feeling or embarrassing. And yet it's so important. It's so important that we look somebody in the eyes because when we do, we're saying, you are important. Jesus says, looked at him and loved him. Number two, listen with your heart. You see, Jesus did all of these things that we're looking at about listening. He did he, with the rich young ruler. Here in John 4, I cited, it's too long to, uh, to put the whole verse on your outline, but in John 4, he's talking to the woman at, in Samaria, at the woman at the well. And she's bringing up doctrinal issues and, and, and all kinds of, of things. She's saying, hey, you know, should people worship there? And, and your tradition says this. And see, Jesus could have got caught up into that, but he was listening and really tuning into her with his ears and he and he was listening for something else and so he he goes you know really the issue is is you have a, you have a lot of hurt from your broken relationships you've been married five times the person you're with right now is not your husband and that was the that was the issue because he was listening with his ears you see when you listen with your ears you're able to see past just logical discourse you're able to see past a reason and rational thinking, which is important, but you're able to see past that, and you're able to see into what people are feeling, whether they're hurting, whether they're in pain. All of those things are very, very important if we're going to be good listeners. Dr. Arthur Gates, in his book, Educational Psychology, said this, quote, sympathy is something that the human species universally craves. The child eagerly displays his injury, or even inflicts a cut or bruise in order to reap abundant sympathy. For the same purpose, adults show their bruises and relate their accidents and illnesses. And so when you're listening with your heart, you want to be asking, where, what's, what is the hurt? What is the pain that this person is, is in? Particularly if it's a sensitive argument. And, and if they're angry, you know, some people say, you know what, I don't want to listen anymore because all I get is uh, this barrage of anger. But listen, anger is a secondary emotion. There's always something behind that of somebody feeling uh, fearful or they're hurting. Hurt people hurt people. And that means they're hurting from something. And that's why they're hurting you. And so if you just, but it's hard. You're, if you're like me, when somebody's angry at me, I just want to, I want to come right back. I want to get defensive, maybe go on the attack, but then I'm no longer listening. We're talking about listening and the value of that and how that helps our relationships. And so when somebody's angry, what I want to do is be able to dial back a little bit, maybe take a deep breath and just say, and maybe pray and say, God, what's causing this? What, what are they afraid of? Are they afraid of losing me? Are they afraid of losing something important to them? Are they afraid their, their health is failing? Is there something maybe unrelated, but it's still fear and it's coming out here? Is there some kind of pain, some kind of hurt? And see, when you can do that, like Jesus did with the woman at the well, it transforms the relationship. So we listen with our heart is an important part of listening. If we're really going to make some 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 headway then you make time to listen of course that's important the average couple in america spends 26 minutes a week in serious conversation and in hampton roads it's probably less because so many of the so many uh adults work here uh and 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 they just come home and they see each other you know a good night kiss go to bed get up have breakfast and they're gone and most meals there's very little talking they don't gather around. It's just, it's just, there's not a lot of it. And so if we don't schedule it, then often it just doesn't happen. 
And so you schedule it. You think, hey, I'm gonna, this is important enough. And if you're, if you're, if you're uh, married, you should be going on a date. You should continue to date your mate. It doesn't end at the wedding, uh, at, the, at the vows. You continue to date and you continue to date. And when you date, you don't go to the movies. Because when you go to the movies, you just watch other people talk, do all the talking. <laughs> right? The most you say is, is pass the popcorn. You, you don't even have to do that, right? You just kind of grab the thing. You know? <laughs> right? You want some Coke. <laughs> you can get away with very little talking. So you want to do stuff, you, in a date you want to talk, you maybe go on a nice drive, go on a walk down at the ocean front, take a bike ride, take a walk, you know, go to dinner. There's a lot of things you can do to encourage talking. A movie, movies are fine, but that is not a date. Certainly you're not going to do listening, you're not going to be listening to somebody else in that environment. The art of listening your, to your mate, Cecil Osborne said this, quote, could you listen? When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving me advice, you haven't done what I've asked. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you're just trampling on my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel like you have to do something to solve my problems, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. Listen. All I ask that you do is listen, not talk, not do just hear me out. Advice is cheap. I'm not helpless. Maybe discouraged, maybe faltering, but not helpless. When you accept as a simple fact that I do feel what I feel, no matter how irrational, then I can quit trying to convince you and get about the business of understanding it all. So please listen and just hear me. And if you want to talk, wait a minute for your turn and then I'll listen to you. So it is important that we listen and then we, we're not, we give somebody their due before we just launch into what we have to say. Now, here's what's so interesting is the things we've been talking about, the skills at listening, are the very same skills that it takes to listen to God. God wants to speak to you as well. He wants to have a relationship. And so it's the very same things. And so it really makes no sense. If you don't have good listening skills and you can't put those in with other people, why would you think you can listen well to God? And the question, and the answer is, you can't. And that's why it's so important that we not only learn listening skills that we apply to people, but also to the Lord. Matthew 17, 5 says this. This is my son. God's saying this. This is my son. What does it say? Listen to him, right? That's our number one priority as Christians is to be listening to God. God, what, are you, what am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to be living my life? How am I supposed to be reacting to this person? How am I supposed to be answering this situation? He said, he's doing it in our own efforts. We've done that with moderate or mediocre or less results, right? But when we're going to have superior relationships, it means it takes superior listening. And the way we do that is learn to listen to God as well. We're, God, what are you saying? What do you want me to be doing? How do I respond? How does God speak? Well, look at Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. So, so Jesus' words. So we, we, that, we find that in, God, in the Bible. You open up the Bible. Now, most people don't read the Bible anymore, even though it's actually easier to get access to than ever before. You can get version, which is free, a number of other free apps right on your, right on your, your, uh, with, uh, on your mobile device with multiple translations, so easy. And yet, when we pull out our mobile device, we go first thing in the morning, most people just go right to social media. They just check Instagram or Facebook or maybe check their emails. And let me just challenge you. Instead of doing that, if, you're, if you want to hear from God, if you want, and God, he says, listen to my son, is what God tells us. The first thing you do each day, it can hold, I know how exciting Instagram is and, and Facebook and all that. It's just, woo, gives the, all that dopamine, all the dopamine that just rushes to us, right? Oh, oh, it's amazing. I just say, pause for five minutes and just open up God's word and read that. Read it, and listen, and if you're a five-minuter, which is, there is no shame in that, I'm proud of you, because you're way above the curve. If you read, but if you're a five-minute person, that's the most you can give at this time in your life, then read sequentially. Don't just jump around. That doesn't really help you a whole lot. 
read sequentially. Start with a book like the Gospel of John. Start with maybe a New Testament passage like Romans or something. And then just work your way through. Each five minutes, you just read a, a portion, a, a, a you know, paragraph. Or if you're a fast reader, maybe a whole chapter. And you just, and then, you know, and you reflect on it. This is how you hear what God speaks to you. And every day, God says he wants to talk to you. Notice he, what's our closing verse, Hebrews 3, 7. As the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Every day, God wants to speak to you. Today's that day where he says, I want to speak to you. So let's pray right now. Lord, we know that listening is loving. And so we ask for your loving presence to, right now, Lord, to come and help us take a step toward loving others. Maybe they're not easy to love. They're not easy to listen to. We all know about listening. But as we've read your word today, maybe we can grow in that area a little more. If we put aside some of those blocking things that keep us from really listening. Would you say, Lord, help me to not assume what other people are thinking. Help me to not try to read their mind. But help me to be a patient listener. To not interrupt. To not jump to conclusions. Would you say, God, help me to receive advice from others through asking questions and even through criticism. Some of you might be in a place where you were the one kind of always discounting somebody's criticism because of where it was coming from. And today, would you, I'm just going to just ask you to pray. Say, God, help me to not do that anymore. If it's not valid, throw it out. But Lord, if sometimes I can learn things from my critics regardless of their own behavior, help me not to invalidate it. You say, God, help me to Look at people in the eyes. Give them my undivided attention. To listen with my heart. To move past logical arguments and look for the hurt or the fear that is behind what they're saying. And most of all, would you say, God, help me to listen to you. Help me to listen to you. I'm going to just invite you to pray this challenge. Say, God, every day this week, I'm going to spend five minutes listening to you by reading the Bible. Just take it one chunk at a time. Don't worry, don't, this is not a lifetime commitment. I'm asking you to pray for one week, for the next seven days. Would you say, God, for the next seven days, the first five minutes I'm going to give to you. If you've never invited Christ into your life, I invite you to say with me, just say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for writing the things that I've wronged and giving me strength and hope in life, in my relationships, and in my eternity. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.